Welcome everyone indeed, and uh, thanks for joining Namali and me for this uh, Enneagram Type 4 panel. And to create some context, the Enneagram is a personality type system which divides human personalities into nine types based on specific preferences and drives. And we can use the Enneagram framework to better understand the behavior of ourselves and others. And today, Namali and I are hosting a panel with people who primarily identify as Enneagram type fours. And we can think of type fours as passionate individualists who are likely to be imaginative, sensitive, and creative. And often type fours are called individualists or romantics because of their tendency to experience themselves as being fundamentally different from other people. Indeed, type fours typically experience themselves as being unique, both in the sense of being uniquely gifted and in the sense of being uniquely flawed. Now, because type fours regard themselves as unique, they can sometimes believe that no one can really understand or love them for who they are. And also because type fours feel unlike anyone else, they can sometimes feel envious of others because other people seem to be suffering less in life than type fours do. So type fours are deeply focused on their own individual experiences. And of course, one of the advantages of being deeply focused on themselves is that type fours are typically highly aware of their feelings, their preferences and their motivations. And they're often able to communicate their experiences with liberating honesty and vulnerability. Now, of course, one of the disadvantages of being deeply focused on themselves is that type fours can be a little self-obsessed and become lost in their emotions and imagination. Now, just like we saw during the type two and type three panels, type fours are shame types. And type fours typically express shame, generally because they feel inadequate when comparing themselves to others. And if we think of type fours in terms of levels of functioning, we can say that when type fours function at an average level, they tend to be self-aware, sensitive, and emotionally honest, but they can also be self-absorbed, brooding, and self-pitying. And when type fours function at an unhealthy level, they can become self-destructive, victimized, and hateful. And when type fours function at a healthy level, they tend to be original, intuitive, and inspired. Now, broadly speaking, type fours can cultivate healthy functioning by learning to separate who they are from how they're feeling, by accepting their individual life as it is, and learning to feel gratitude for all of their blessings, and by focusing both on the significant differences between themselves and others, as well as on the significant similarities between themselves and others. So, Namali, as someone who identifies as a type four yourself, what more can you share about these enigmatic type fours? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Lee, when you said uh, fours can do better if they can learn to uh, separate themselves from their feelings, I went, what? Oh, my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I'll add a couple other sort of um, characteristics that are similar to all uh, fours, and then I'll describe it briefly what the subtypes, why the fours can also look very different, even if all a bunch of us fours were in a room alone together, will still look very different from one another. Uh, the basic fear for the fours, um, every type of four, is that they fear that they have no identity or that they have no personal significance. And the basic desire, every type has a basic fear and a basic desire. And for the four, the basic desire is to then find themselves and their significance in the world. And so in other words, sort of like creating an identity for themselves. Um, and what's often... Uh, holding uh, Enneagram 4s back from sort of really truly shining and giving their gifts is that, um, and I really sort of read this somewhere, um, um, and I'm on a, unfortunately I didn't uh, note down where I read this, but it kind of captures everything so well. I got it from one of the websites, but um, 4s view the world through the lens of beauty and loss they unconsciously believe that they lack something essential that everyone else has. And when Lee was speaking about the envy piece, which is a really big part of the type four personality, that's where the envy really begins. It's that they feel unconsciously, they're sort of in this belief that 
that we lack something that's really essential, yet we don't know what that is. And without knowing what that is, four still feel that everyone else has it. And only we force don't have it. And so this is where the envy really begins. And there's shame around it because we we be, we have this, uh, we begin to sort of compare ourselves to others. And it's a conundrum uh, often for us where we feel like there's this tug of war between really wanting to be different, but also wanting to be, wanting or believing that there's something lacking that everyone else has, therefore also wanting to be like others. So it's a real tug of war for a, for a four here. And this, and continuing to read that, which I got from this website, this feeling of being different shapes their identity and lets them focus on themselves and what it means to be truly them. They hope that if they search long enough, they will find what they're looking for. Or better yet, that someone else will swoop, swoop down, pick them up and show them what they were made for, made for all along. So there's a little bit of a rescue, come and rescue me type of thing that um, fours do as well. Um, every type on, on the Enneagram has a wing. So it's the wings are the two types that we're closest to. So for a, a four, that some of us will have a wing that is the five wing, and for some of us, the three wing. Those of us who have a three wing will actually look a little bit like a three at times. And they're referred to in the Enneagram language as the aristocrat. Um, typically fours that are somewhat sort of withdrawn and introverted sort of stereotypically speaking, with a three wing, they are actually more ambitious, more action oriented, and they can actually be a little bit more extroverted and more uh, sort of seeking out friendship and connection. Um, and not afraid necessarily to be seen, which the other five, uh, the other four with the five wing is perhaps a little more introverted, a little bit more sort of in hiding sometimes. So um, they are referred to as the bohemian. They're a little bit more unconventional and a little bit more logical. And typically, they're okay sort of doing things for themselves um, rather than wanting to be sort of catering to how others might actually want, how others might want to see them. And then I think we're all aware that there are stress point and integration point arrows for every type. And for the type four, um, force can be a little removed and withdrawn typically, but when they're really struggling and under stress, they might look like an unhealthy version of a type two. So they become over-involved with others sometimes. And, and then as a result, also becoming clingy and needy. Um, but when a four is really integrated and they're happy and they're healthy and they're relaxed, they can actually look more like a healthy version of a type one. They're able to let down their guard. They can leave their sort of emotional uh, drama to, to some sense even, kind of set it aside and really get to action, just become much more practical and pragmatic and get things done and get moving and really build a routine for themselves and be disciplined. The subtypes. So this is also really important. And this is how a lot of any people within the single type can look very different from one another. So the subtypes are that we are either self-preserving, that we are social, or that we are sexual. And some traditions will uh, refer to sexual as one-to-one. -one. Self-preserving, as it's sort of self-explanatory in some ways, is that self-preserving uh, self, uh, types are trying to preserve themselves. They're trying to protect themselves in that way. Um, and so a type four that is a self-preserving four is actually internalizing. Fours in general are very sort of connected to suffering in a way. They're sort of in some odd way, type fours are the ones in the Enneagram that are most connecting to the emotional sensitivity and the sort of the darker side of our emotional life. And that's that's a lot of pain and suffering in many ways. And a type four that is self-preserving internalizes that pain. They turn it inwardly. 
and potentially re they repress their suffering. And they're sometimes referred to as long suffering. Um, they don't, but they don't want others to know that. So they're in some ways a counter type. They, they are a four that looks less like the stereotype of the four because they actually have a more sunny, more positive attitude. And they're also called dauntless. In other words, they're sort of willing to jump into new situations. They'll pack up and move if, if their suffering gets too much. Um, they're willing to take risks and that, preser that preservation instinct is really highlighted. Um, they really want to seek that which is really authentic for them. So at times they can look like a one or a, even a three or a seven because they're a little bit more action oriented and they'll they'll sort of hide their pain and their suffering and yet sort of go get their work done. Uh, the social is more group focused. So they're sort of looking for survival and looking to be sort of... Um, looking to feel safe in some ways in how they're relating to the group. Um, so they are the ones who are most stereotypically, they resemble what we hear of as a four. So they also suffer a lot. They carry around a lot of pain, um, but they're comfortable with sharing their darker emotions. So they'll kind of open up to others, unlike the self-preserving four almost as if sharing their pain with others is the way to gain connection and friendship. Um, they're quite uh, comfortable sharing their vulnerability. So they're kind of like an open book. They don't really hide their pain or their suffering, which can make others either really appreciate that, but also be really difficult for others to be around that. But And they're also said to be the most sensitive of the fours. And um, they can actually really feel into the suffering in a group, for example, and really tend to others because they have such a connection. Um, they're also, um, this is another that I'll just read from a, a net website called the Enneagram Network. Um, the name given to this social Enneagram 4 is called the critical commentator. Their feelings of deficiency can be provoked by social situations when with envy directed towards other people's status or membership. This subtype, so just to clarify, a, a self-preserving four will look at others, compare themselves to others, and put themselves at the bottom of the pile. The social four will tend to see themselves as not the bottom, but like I'm actually coming up better uh, after comparing myself. Um, and they are sort of the emotional truth teller sometimes for the whole group. The sexual one is externalizing their suffering. So they will actually sort of uh, really project their suffering outwardly. They will compare themselves to others and tend to perhaps see, see themselves as better, a little bit sort of what actually social does, does it both ways. And the, self um, the, the sexual four will often actually even display anger and more competitiveness because they're so much, um, they're so kind of invested in developing that image for themselves as unique and special and all of that, which means that they're actually competing with others often. And so this sexual four can even resemble a type eight. And in some cases, it's said that the sexual four is one of the angriest types on the Enneagram. Uh, sometimes even angrier than an Enneagram type eight. Um, and that competition is really sort of used to overcome the feeling of inner deficiency. So they create more motivation with that. Um, so let me pause there for um, with the subtypes. And I'll go to, I'll, I'll start with Cheryl maybe and... Um, just because, Cheryl, you're alphabetically first. So we would love to hear from you, Cheryl. How did you discover that you are a type four? And how do those type four characteristics show up in your life? Yeah, so um, I learned about the Enneagram probably about 15 or so years ago. And um did a, the ready test, not the not the one that you pay for, um, a number of times, 
and uh, pretty consistently came out as a four. Although I've I had some thoughts that maybe I was a five as well. Those both of those came out really strongly, but um, really settled on the four um, if, for a number of reasons. One of them is that sense of um, something missing. <sighs> that there's something missing in me that other people seem to have, and I just can't seem to get a handle on it. Is really strong for me and was particularly strong when in adolescence and then for, you know, going into adulthood. It was just, I could not, you know, I was waiting for that moment when I would become me. And I seem to see this in my friends and people all around me and they seem to be blossoming and getting very comfortable with themselves. And I just was, I had none of that. Like I had no sense of who I was. Um, and um, it was a really painful reality for me. It was uh, really hard and, and stayed with me for quite some time. And I still f- I can still feel that at times, although it's, um, it's not nearly as acute as it used to be. And, and, and along with that was that sense of being uniquely broken. Like nobody's suffering, or at least nobody that I could see so it seemed to be suffering the way that I was. Um, I had a distinct feeling of not fitting into my family, that somehow I was different from them. And how did, you know, like they were all just seems like to be logical, practical people. And I wasn't any of those things. Um, And also that focus on, um, yeah, deficiencies, differences and deficiencies seem to always um, with me still something that, uh, Although, you know, like a lot of these things, I don't suffer with the same. There's still little bits and pieces of them there. And so I'm talking specifically now about how I knew I was a four. And the one, the one thing that hurt, like really hurt me was the, um, it hurt because I've, I recognize it so much, was that fours can be really difficult in relationships. Mm-hmm. It can be kind of crazy making in relationships. And that's a part of that romanticizing relationships in particular, uh, intimate relationships, and having this sense that this was just going to be the answer to everything this person was going to, as you say, was going to rescue me, it, everything was going to change, and and then discovering pretty quickly they weren't. And so there's just that real push-pull thing, like really, really wanting that connection, but no, it's not really working, and um, um, so that, yeah, that that one was tough. I found that one really, really hard, but I, I really recognize that in myself. Um, on the positive side, um, of Ross, Hus- Ross Hudson, I think mm-hmm. in one of his books, t- says a four is the deep sea diver of the psyche. And I loved that. And I get really related to that because um, I love getting in into the psyche and into um, the depths of personalities and um, uh, I can do chit chat now, but there was a time when I just, you know, like <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with small talk. Like let's just get really down into this stuff and, and i um, really comfortable actually with sadness and grief and loss and feel a really strong connection to those in a real beauty in that space. And um, I heard someone describe Leonard Cohen as being able to hold equally the light and the darkness and that really relates. So like there's in the darkness, there is a light and, and, and vice versa. Those just really, um, yeah, strong for me. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. And a lot of us fours really do love Leonard Cohen. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Imago. How did you discover, Imago, that you are a four? And how do the four characteristics show up in you? Um. How did I? Oh, um, a friend. A friend talked to me about it and said, oh, there's going to be a training. Do you, you want to come? And I was like, very curious and always looking for a way to fix myself. So, of course, I went along. <laughs> and um, anyway, they gave us a questionnaire and I filled it in and it looked like I was a four. And then um, the next day they had the panels and so the first 
one came, then two, then three, and then the fourth came. And there was three people, and they were all very artistic. Um, I think one was a painter, one was a musician, and I can't remember what the third one did. Very colourful, um, and, and all had some form of mental illness, which was kind of like that expression of, you know, being very, you know, overwhelmed by sadness and loss and all those kinds of things. And anyway, I remember after I listened to them all talking, I was like, oh, my God, yes, that is me. And um, one of the guys was, we were going for a cup of tea, and one of the guys was standing there, so I was chatting with him. And then he said, oh, we better go and get a cup of tea or we miss out. And so we were walking into the room where the cups of tea were, and we heard these people saying, oh, my God, aren't you glad you're not one of those? (laughs) <laughs> and so it was like really brought home to me oh my goodness this is something that I really need to you know have a look at so I, I guess from then on it sort of I guess it gave me a bit of an idea of what was going on because um, I was adopted and so like the whole idea of not fitting in was kind of like had that whole um, experience of actually not coming from a family like I I, we, didn't, we didn't have anything in common. So there was that. And then just the kind of thing of, yeah, that, that sense of lack. There's like there's something wrong with me. And I think um, the things that like are really great about being a type four, you know, the beauty and the creativity wasn't really very welcome in my family. Like everybody thought that was bizarre. And so that sort of natural inclination towards those really positive things was kind of suppressed. And so all that was really left was a sense of loss. And I was really sensitive. And I can remember, you know, that was also something that wasn't really welcome. Um, And so I guess it just exacerbated. And so over time, life got pretty dark, I have to say. Um, And yeah, and of course, this is all prior to me, like understanding what my Enneagram typology was. (laughs) I'm just kind of like, wandering around literally in the dark, like being, you know, depressed and having relationships that didn't work because this kind of urge to connection, you know, to be really deeply connected was obviously being thwarted because people were really uncomfortable with my relating style, which is to want to know everything about people. I want to, you know, I want to have those really deep conversations, just like Cheryl said. I wanted a lot of intimacy. Um, I was probably pretty blunt about the way I went around it because I, you know, didn't really know what I was doing. It was just kind of was inherent. And and I guess also, you know, the envy part of it was looking around and seeing these people who appeared to fit and thinking, well, what what's wrong with me? Like, why can't I have that? Um, and so yeah, that went on for a really long time. Um, but the light sort of started to come in, I, you know, when I was sort of in my early 20s, I um, I decided that, you know, I'd find out what I wanted to do in life and I became a florist. And then from that, you know, I then became a gardener. And so I started to have this place where I could sort of um, express my need for beauty. And that was hugely liberating. Um, and so that was kind of like my go-to place. And then as a result of that, I started to, get these kind of knowings if you like which later on I could see that that was like spirit was actually talking to me through my garden you know but I couldn't have articulated that at the time and eventually I had the sense of this this envy that I'm feeling it's more a yearning it's a yearning to connection and ultimately a yearning to oneness with spirit so that kind of led me onto a spiritual path so I, I guess it, yeah, it was pretty. It was a pretty challenging start, um, you know. As Cheryl has said, you know, it makes relationships difficult. My my relationships were definitely very challenging. I didn't know who I was. I felt really lost. Um, I felt like I was really broken and wrong. Um, I think I'm probably a social type four, so I was always wanting to be, you know, meet people and find connections, and I still do, and I am actually quite good at that. Um, but yeah, just kind of like wandering around in the dark, like literally. Um, but just 
kind of like learning that, oh, my goodness, there's, there's an explanation for this. Like, you know, it's not that you're wrong or broken. It's just that there's a, there's a path here. And so working with the typology and being able to sort of um, get to grips with, you know, what was really going on and then go, oh, okay, I can actually, I can actually change this. I can actually look at this differently. Um, starting to see the value in being able to be connected to other people's suffering, but not actually take, you know, not actually taking it in. And also what you said about um, separating out who I am from my emotions, like all of that stuff became really, really useful. And yeah, and I guess that that's it's it's still unfolding. You know, I'm still finding my way, but I feel like now I'm really basically enjoying the gift to a much much larger degree than than the less pleasant aspects. And really they don't even feel like an issue anymore either. They're just, you know, it's just a, a thing that I have, this capacity to feel suffering. And like with everything that's happening here at, at the moment, I am actually feeling quite emotional. And I don't have to let that take over. You know, I can just say, okay, well, that makes sense that you would be feeling that. And, you know, how can I show up without that getting in the way of me, you know, being able to help? So um, I, I'm, I'm really grateful. I mean, I didn't feel that when I was younger, but I am exceedingly grateful now. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Imago. Thanks for sharing. So we'll go next to Jolene. Well, everything that Cheryl and Imago said, <laughs> and, um, feeling into this type, I first discovered the Enneagram in the, the 90s. Um, there was a, a Catholic nun, and I believe the Enneagram was brought here by the Catholics from France. I'm not sure that um, she she gave in services to my office every week for a half a year. And so I pretty quickly um, sussed out that I was a four, mostly because of this sort of tragic romantic and this sort of tendency to melancholy. And um, what Cheryl said about, you know, like feeling different, you know, I, I, I oftentimes as a child, I felt like, was I adopted? I mean, I don't get it with my parents or maybe, maybe I'm a Martian, you know, I mean, I didn't understand the cruelty of kids. Um, and I, I, I really couldn't form relationships when I was young just because I felt like such an oddball and my closest um, connections were with animals. And I had, um, you know, just this real sense of, of, you know, understanding with dogs or cats or, you know, because it was all nonverbal. It was more of a sort of an energetic or a, a affectionate kind of connection, which I really understood. I was, uh, I took a test um, maybe, I don't know, a couple years ago with the Art of Growth, I believe. And, and, and they had, um, you know, they could tell you what, what your stack was. So I, and I, I took another test from another um, organization and the stacks were always the same. So I was a self-preservation and the sexual was really close. Um, and then the social was pretty low. And that's kind of an interesting because I the self preservation and the sexual are a little bit opposing. You know, they sort of fight each other. The and I sense that in myself too. This sort of risk taking of the sexual and then the self preservation sort of you know. So I've noticed that also in in just a little bit of a nuance there that I can really take risks and at other times I'm really afraid to take risks. So it's. That's kind of an interesting um, observation. With the the self pres, I I really notice, and I've looked back on my life this sense of grit, you know, being able to do hard things and not really complain about it is too much. I I was a single mother for nine and a half years, going through college in a really really tough academic program, doing well in in tough situations. Um, so that's a that's a I think a real positive. Um, I do have a pretty sunny outlook, although I, it does I have uh, this sort of underlying 
melancholy. So there, it's almost like this Neapolitan cake. You know, I have all these different flavors that that can come out. Um, one thing that I uh, I notice about fours is you can always tell a four by, in some ways, by looking at them because they they wear they dress in a very artistic kind of a little bit flamboyant. Um, you know, just the way they wear their their clothes or their hair or you know, just it, it's it's kind of fun to be in a crowd and and not know who anybody is, but you can always sort of point out or, uh, you know, feel into uh, somebody's personality by what they wear. And I definitely notice that in myself. I love dresses and um, jewelry. And um, I once ran away from home when I was six years old and I put all my dresses in a brown paper bag and left, you know, <laughs> it's just, I think because the, the sense of, of, um, being defective is, is, um, I really picked that up with Cheryl and, and Imago too, is that, that sense of just, there's something wrong with me that I just don't. Um, and, and so having an understanding of this as a pattern of my behavior or my, my emotional, um, architecture, I can notice it happening and then recognize that's just a pattern of it's it's not real it's it's just it's something that's there and so i can i can kind of quickly look at it as an object and and question it, its validity and so you know the floor is the deep diver it's on the bottom of the enneagram and i do love to just be authentic with people and honest and, uh, you know, that's what, that's what attracted me to the Integral Institute when they had, I think there was some, I don't know, some classes that I attended, but I was, I was, I was drawn to it because of the authentic relating. And that's where I wanted to uh, be able to, you know, bypass all the crap of, you know, the per persona or, you know, the, you know, just get down to what's really uh real and, and important and you know that it doesn't bother me to talk about um uh, death or um shame or you know dark depressions or you know i i'm i kind of i'm i'm totally open and accepting of that so um as far as like the positives i like imago i i find beauty and flowers <laughs> but i'm really really i i notice i'm i'm a photographer and i i i have a huge garden and i grow flowers and then i i create um bouquets and i photograph them and publish them but i always have to it's like i always have to be special you know <laughs> oh i did that i did that before now i need to do something special it has to be so I'm, there's this tension that if it's not unique or it's different. You know, it has to be different. It has to be unique. It has to not be like what I did before. So I have a tremendous amount of pressure that I put on myself to be special and unique. And um, I guess I, I, in different points in my life, I was, I had more of a three wing um, when I had a, a private practice and, you know, I had to sort of present myself professionally, but then I kind of, you know, go over more to the five wing when I'm, you know, really studying and, and I'm very attracted to this studies academics. So. Thank you, Jolene. So, um, so maybe uh, Jonathan and then Sandy, and hopefully this is a big panel. So, um, we'll try to keep moving along and uh, we definitely want to hear more from each of you in our next round. So uh, let's go to Jonathan now. I feel like I can keep this short by just saying, yeah, me too, <laughs> so far. <laughs> um, in all honesty, if I wasn't sure I was a four, there's no doubt now. Um, so one of the themes here is, um, oh, well, I think I was adopted. 
<laughs> or I, I think I was, I was uh, put here by uh, a spaceship from another planet. You know, this was sort of a, a running joke in my family, but it indicated just the sense of, I don't feel like I quite belong here. Um, the language of emotions has always been very natural to me. Uh, speaking feelings, being comfortable with, with conversations on feelings. Um, it, I feel like a fish in water. Um, it's just so familiar and comfortable to me. The problem when I was younger with that was that I could be overwhelmed by my emotions. I, I felt too much and they came in too fast and hard. Um, and, and that caused a lot of individual disturbance and relational disturbance early on. I think that the positive side of it early on was just that feeling into everything, it really animated my world in a, in, in a big way. The world wasn't just this place of solid stuff. It, it just, everything just seemed to have feeling to me, reflected feeling. Um, and I could feel like some people have said, I, I, I could feel into the beauty and I can feel into the sadness, um, both. And I was comfortable, I was comfortable with both. So, so for example, I, when I think of the four seasons, like I can, each of them has a feel to me. I can feel into it. However, because I think I'm that sort of natural melancholy type of person, um, I think I land on autumn, <laughs> you know, the ending of things, um, that, that kind of sadness that, that exists in autumn. Um, it just speaks to me in such, such a big way. Um, so I think that's a big part of, of being a four, and, and that's certainly my uh, part of me. Um, actually, that makes me think of when, when in my 20s, I was in graduate school, I was studying various uh, Asian uh, religions and philosophies, and I came across this concept out of Japan called uh, mono no aware. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, the professor at the time described it, translated as the sweet sorrow of human existence. Man, I landed on that one. <laughs> I'm like, that's me. <laughs> I said, I love this term because that describes me. And so it's a little bit of that sort of autumn thing. Um, but as I said, it, it, it caused me some, some problems early on, too. I was a little bit overwhelmed and confused by emotions. It caused relational issues. Um, I remember being in therapy early on in my 20s and saying to the therapist, I just feel things in a deep way and, and just kept on repeating it because I, I was having a hard time just delineating my feelings. Um, and the therapist actually got kind of frustrated with me and says, what do you mean by that? Which kind of ended that relationship. Um, <laughs> but it was just an indication that I, I didn't have it all sorted out. And, and that was part of my arc of growth to look inside and really try to figure things out. Um, but that was also the good thing because, you know, through, growth and, and really investigating and looking inward, you know, I came out with self-knowledge, a vocabulary of, of, of my emotions and, and also as they relate to other people. And, that, and that's helped me a lot, both personally and professionally. One of the things that's been a major theme of my life is, uh, Namali, you were mentioning the, 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 seek, the, the, the search for identity. For me, that came in, in mostly in terms of, uh, needing to be authentic almost at all costs in, in in almost every everything i did you know is this an authentic hobby you know is this an authentic sport i'm engaged is this an authentic relationship is this an authentic course job you know and i always felt that I had to my decisions had to grow out of sort of organically and it was always what do i feel about this not what do they think about it not that i didn't think but but what resonated with me much more was how am I feeling about this? Um, and that, and that one could be very difficult, especially, you know, in a culture that I think didn't always prize um, things that I thought were important. Um, and, and certainly I could get caught up in, in sort of the more materialistic aspects of, of life. But in the end, it didn't work for me because it didn't feel authentic. And so as much as that was a struggle, it did lead me on to, what I felt were more meaningful careers, for example, for, for me, courses of studying careers. I, I ended up becoming both a teacher and a therapist. And, and certainly being a four with a control of my feelings, with having um, 
uh, uh, more facility in, in working with my feelings, I think I was a much more effective teacher, much more uh, effective therapist. And, and especially, I, I think, because I, I don't shy away from the darker feelings. Um, the problem early on was probably it was, was wallowing in that kind of thing, wallowing in sorrow, wallowing in loss, this kind of thing. But as I've grown and matured and looked at these things, I have much better um, handle on them, much more greater awareness. And so I can work with them better and, and therefore have helped myself, but also may be able to help people. And, and I think the advantage of, of being able to go to the darker places where many people are not comfortable being has, has helped me to, um, one, just appreciate the lighter side and the, and the beauty of things, right, in, in contrast, but also to talk that language. You know, it's, a, it's the language of, well, it's the language of life, right? The, the, there's no light without dark. Uh, you know, it's the language of, of soul. So I feel it's made me much more well-rounded to be able to go to these places and be comfortable and not necessarily be so resistant or fearful um, of these places that helped me a lot, um, again, both personally and, and professionally. But, but it's, it's, it's taken a lot of work to get to that place because certainly being a four has its challenges. Um, but I look back and I think, it's it's just it just enabled me to be a much more integrated and whole person. I mean that process is 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 going on and continues and will continue forever. But the work has really allowed me to 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 be much more whole and integrated. Um, um, yeah, I'm a I'm a pretty happy for at this point. <laughs> nice, thank you, Jonathan. So we'll go to Sandy. How did you figure out you were a four and how do those characteristics show up in you? First of all, I, I, I got a bunch of books from a lady in Flagstaff that, that knew all about the Enneagram and I read them and I read them and I was trying to decide what I was because I didn't know I, back those days we didn't have internet and I was just reading them all. And I, I and then it sort of made sense. Like, I guess I'm a four because um, but I'm not really a typical four, like because I don't act dramatic. I'm not melodramatic, although I was when I was younger. In, internally, I was dramatic, more masochistic, I think. Um, I'm a self-preservation for, and, and when I look back on my life, I think that two people here said that they thought they were adopted and one was adopted. I was adopted too. There's something about being adopted where you were abandoned. You know, I was five months old. I had great parents, but I never felt like I fit in. Um, everybody else's story I can relate to in terms of not fitting in, feeling there was something wrong with me. Um, but I was determined to get away and do something with my life. I was a straight A student. I went to I went on a couple of um, summer trips with um, a Christian singing group as Continental Singers, and I traveled around the world. And I the first summer was real dramatic because they said the next summer I was started dating my director. I was really special then, and um, he um, they said I was a problem child. So I've, I've always sort of had that carrying me and through my life. And yet I think I've also pursued um, excellence. I went to college I, and, and then I went to grad school and I was determined, but I always had somebody to go to like to, that understood me. I, my, I had a professor in college that went to my grad school and he went out there and he just said, you have to get a PhD, you have to get a PhD. And, and again, made me feel special. And I always turned to him to, to I, whatever was going on. So I got into, into therapy in college and then I, in grad school, one of our, our professors were all talking and this one professor said, you know, he asked me to come into his office and I said, I was a brand new grad student. And he said, do you want to change or just feel better? <laughs> I was like, I want to change, you want to change. So I did, I did psychoanalysis four times a week for three years on the couch. It was really cheap. Um, and I, so, and then I went on to more therapy and more therapy. I've just done therapy my whole life and I'm, I'm a really good therapist now. So uh, last night I had a dream that woke me up at four o'clock. <laughs> I couldn't go back to sleep. I had a dream that I was looking out the window and my ex-husband was there and all the his kids and my kids, and they were all doing wonderful things that I couldn't join them. I was still left out. And I go, 
oh no, the envy is still there. It's come back. It was like, it was like, um, anyhow, that, that was, it woke me up and it made me realize that I've been envious a lot during my life. But, um, but when I'm envious, I try to make it happen. I've been a leader all my life, you know, things like that. So I've, I've, and I'm a, a good therapist. Um, I know we're, it seems like everybody's sort of going on to what they, they like about being a four. Um, when I first went to a group of fours, I really liked all the colors, like everyone's saying, all the colorful. I was at a table with all fours with, when Mary was with me at the this um, retreat. And that's when she discovered she was a three. And I, I had already embraced my four. And um, I had a boyfriend that was a, a flaming seven. And he just loved my four. And I loved him. And then we went to the you know, we were at the, I was at the table with all the colorful people. I loved it. So I embraced my four pretty good, but then it really helped me to find out the subtypes. So that's, um, I don't have to go on much more than that. If, unless we're going to, we're going to probably talk about how we've grown through our four in the next episode. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Sandy. And, and thanks everyone. It It's really wonderful to hear the both the diversity of experience and the similarities in in um, in relating to yourself and others in the world. It's uh, uh, and I don't know if this if, if it's the same for the audience. Oh, I see Mary's giving a heart, uh, but it is uh, there is a focus, uh, a drawing in emotionally of others. I think when all of you share your vulnerability in in such a. Uh, I would say a, a very inviting and a revealing way, which encourages others to meet you at that level and meet you at that depth in the deep sea. So, uh, thanks for that. So, moving on to the next round, Namali and I were also very interested in the specific struggles and gifts of being a type four. Should we go around in the same order? So, Cheryl, starting with you, please. Sure. I'd just say a, a very quick four thing here is that I'm just very envious about how articulate all of the, <laughs> the fours to feel much more articulate than I usually feel. At, um, so yes, this idea, you know, like making a lot of this stuff object has been huge, you know, like making the melon, you know, looking at the melancholy and realizing that that's not who I am, um, putting order into my life. Right, just getting routines and such has been really, really helpful for me. It gets me out of my head. I still um, struggle with being quite self-conscious about things. It takes me a long time. Like I just feel like I'm constantly moving up through all of these layers of thoughts and emotions, and they can uh, paralyze me. So I have some difficulties with that, but I'm working on it. You know, I feel that that's... Uh, that's that's coming along as I'm as I'm developing one thing that I've really found is that I, I can actually hold that beauty and not get lost in it and as Jonathan said I've certainly known the feeling of wallowing I've been there um, there's something about holding those really deep emotions when I was younger just made me feel like I was living somehow or other like I was really connecting to something but now I'm able to see how that also can flip and one thing that um I'm really enjoying now is the, is that I have more of a sense of humor. Life just the, the beauty also includes lightness, and in, and in, in, as in fun and taking things a lot more lightly than I have before. So I'd say that's one one gift of uh, working through this that I'm just really really enjoying right now. Mm. That's mm, my minute. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Imago, over to you, your minute. Uh, well, uh, I, I guess, you know, the struggle was around sort of the, the, the melancholic aspect of being a four and, and the sense of disconnection. Um, that, was, that was really big and intense. And, and now I would say that, that, that that's kind of evolved into a capacity to be with very dark feelings. I think Jonathan talked about that, to be with very dark feelings when other people are, are experiencing and not turn away, to be able to stay present to that. Um, so that's kind of something that was a struggle that's shifted into a gift. And um, 
just yeah just the love of beauty I mean I I never got to have any kind of an academic education so I everything I've had to kind of like go away and you know read and learn and and I just I love you know obviously nature you know the beauty of nature is really important to me but also art and music I just you know I can't get enough of that and that's just something I think that brings so much lightness into my life um and I don't know whether I, it would have interested me otherwise, but, you know, I just am really grateful that, you know, being a four has attracted me towards that. Um, and also interesting people that want to have interesting conversations. I have a lot of curiosity. Um, so, yeah, it's, I can say now that it feels a very enriching to have come into the world as a four and through the struggles to come to this place of the gifts and, that whole idea of Jonathan talked about, you know, life being bittersweet. But um, it's okay now. Like I can, I can, I can handle both of those. But that's if, if things are a little bit challenging. It's like, well, that's that's half of the story. The other half of the story is there will be a gift. There is the darkness and the light. And to just be able to know that, to know, it's such an empowering thing to be able to know. Well, you know, there's there's. There's these two things, and when and when you're okay with both of them, you know there is a path that you can take. And ultimately, for me, that path was to God. Um, and so, yeah, I I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Mm, it's beautiful. Thanks, Margaret and Julie. How about you? Um, well, I would just say the I guess the gift of the enneagram as a as a whole. Um, has given me a, a way to get out of my narcissism and sort of think that everybody has to do things the way I do. And just to really understand that every, I mean, there's these, you know, 27 different personality types and, you know, just to be able to see all of that and, and to really appreciate it and to, um, to get that I have a, a perspective, but it's a limited perspective. Um, so I don't know if that's necessarily a gift of the four is to the gift of the Enneagram. My, my sense about my fourness, I really like being a four. I really, I guess, because I feel special I don't know. <laughs> or just that I, I appreciate, um, you know, nuance and subtlety and depth and beauty and, you know, just um, being able to see the world from, from this particular perspective and know that it's limited. Okay, thank you. thank you. Jonathan, how about you? So I think the struggle, uh, one of the struggles early on, I, I didn't mention it before, was was around envy. And, and one of the themes that always came up in my early life was the grass is always greener over there. What's going on over there? What's that person doing? What's that person studying? Where is that, what's that, where's that person living? And it was, it was a bit crazy making early on, and I had to grow out of it. Um, I think related to that was was trying to find an authentic path of my own that that once made my own made me not look so much over there, but I had to mature into that. Um, so both sides of that the the the, the grass is greener the, the the struggle to find something authentic. Um, Jolene said something that that made me think too. I I, I had to grow out of expecting people to relate to me in the same way. In, in in these deep feeling ways, right? My my need for connecting on that level, I had to realize was not going to be met um, a lot of times. Um, and that I couldn't suck it out of people or get frustrated with them when they weren't meeting me. I, I had to mature beyond that. So that was also a, a struggle. Mm, thanks, Johnson. Sandy, how about you? Like three years ago, I joined a program called The Living School. It's a, a program that you learn how to be a mystic. You learn to think like a mystic. And it's through the Center for Action and Contemplation. And through that whole process, I, I came. I left church for a long time, but I came back to church. And, and it also encouraged us to do a practice. And three teachers of mine were all fours. And, and that made sense to me. They were all mystics fours. And um and what they emphasize is that suffering is a path to transformation. So I could reframe my suffering to be transformative. Um, I 
started doing a practice every day. I, I read all the time and I read mystics. I've got books all over my coffee table. I'm, and even though I'm done with the program, um, I engage more in silence, in solitude. And one thing that one of the teachers said, she was talking about this article that we were reading. She said, unique. And, and I thought, okay. And then she said, unique is really a one with everyone. And it's a different way of looking at unique, but that really touched me. And that's what, you know, so now I, I approach the whole world as if, you know, I'm one with them and, and that's the practice. It's like, and that's kind of where I'm getting. Um, I, I did some work with Nomali on my fourness when I ran into some problems and um, you know, but I feel like I've, I've come out of for the most part, at least for right now, except for the dream last night, which reminded me that I'm still got envy there. Um, but I, I have my friends that I can talk to. I have really good friends now. I've got Mary who's right here and I've got um this other people from the living school. I've met two beautiful women from the living school and, and they live in Colorado. So it's, it's really kind of cool. And, and I'm doing, I'm just reaching out. I'm building a community here and that's pretty wonderful. Something I always felt like I didn't fit in and, and here I can, anybody can fit in here. You know, it's like, it's great. So that's what I'm doing now. And I spend, I spend, I do my practice online, um, my therapy practice. And then I do my practice by myself and there's a lot of solitude and silence like I said so that's um I'm learning to think like a mystic and learning to be a mystic so that's all excellent thanks Sandy that's wonderful so it's funny when uh, Lee when you post the question of what's a struggle and a gift as a four myself I feel like I can share this for a lot of fours I think that Sometimes for a four, the struggle is the gift. And we can sort of really keep holding on to the struggle because it actually somehow feels like our special and unique gift that we can hold on to this struggle. And then the gift sometimes is, I'm sorry, the struggle sometimes is that a lot of fours are actually really amazingly gifted. But a lot of four struggle to turn that gift into something like a business or, you know, oftentimes they really kind of go into that shame place because they kind of feel like I'm so talented. I'm, I'm like truly a lot of fours are wildly creative and talented and gifted in that way, like really unique abilities. Um, but also like, I know I have a lot of compassion for fours because sometimes the struggle is that they can't, that we can't sometimes, or we feel like we're stuck and unable to make something of the gift. Um, so we stay in that place. So, so uh, just a little bit more before we hand over to our audience for a little uh, engagement there as well. I have one last question. Um, I've been asking this of every panel and hope to ask this of the future panels as well for the other types. Um, we really, you know, our personality is such a part of us and, and it's been traveling and journeying with us since we were like really little people. And so it's hard. It's not always the easiest way in which we show up in the world. And we often feel misunderstood every type. This is true for every type. And so as fours, I'll start with Cheryl again. As a four, Cheryl, how do you wish, and maybe you can even answer this question like a com sentence completion. So you actually start with, I wish that, um, that you would. So I wish that, how do you wish more people understood you, that people were more honoring of who you are as a four? that um, I, I could be given some space mm. and just a little bit of time even to let myself, I alluded to this, it just feels to me like often I'm just working my way through all kinds of layers of emotions and issues and things before I can really pull myself together and come out and, and speak. 
And I know that that has been misinterpreted in the past. I've heard this from people is that they find I can be seen as being quite aloof and wanting to stay apart from things. And that's actually not that at all. I like think others have mentioned is there's a real strong desire to connect very deeply with people. It's just, it takes me a while to get through there. And, and uh, I was at a, a, a deep listening workshop a couple of years ago and we all had to get up and explain where how we got our names so something really pretty simple would, um, and and then the others would say what they were feeling from that and one young fellow said Cheryl seems very gentle and then the instructor said well you know I think that's because she wants us to be gentle with her and I can feel this coming up again is I had never even considered that. But boy, did that hit me hard in, a, in such because it was so true. Is yes. Yeah, so just a little bit of gentleness, please. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. A little bit of gentleness. Yeah. So let's go to Imago. Imago, how do you, what would you wish for? If the world was to understand you, see you, and be more honoring of you as a four? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I was listening to Cheryl. And maybe I've got to a place now where I'm just okay with it how it is. So that question's got me a bit stumped, I have to say. Like nothing really springs to mind. I, I guess... Mm, <sighs> Maybe you know, a wish, yeah, this is kind of magical thinking really, is if people were more willing to do, like engage with their interiors. Okay. So, so, that, so that wasn't such a scary thing because I think just, you know, a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world that's not great is because people have these insecurities and fears about, oh, you know, if, it, if, if people see that, you know, what will it mean? And for us, it's like that's where we want to go. That's our territory. We feel really, you know, happy there. Um, I guess I wish that for other people so that it wasn't such a scary thing. No. Um, how about you, Jolene? Um, I, the thing that popped into my mind was this uh, sense of being defective and abandoned. And so I guess I would want people to um, – you know, be curious about my interior world, um, see me, feel me, hear me. Um, and, you know, we live in such a narcissistic world. Everybody is sort of full of their own, you know, ver and so I guess what I'm asking or what comes to me is just to be aware of other, you know, and, and to explore the interiors of others. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Jolene. How about you, Jonathan? How can we honor you more? So, I, I guess I would I would ask others to to understand, and this would really be, I think, more of an intellectual understanding. Um, I'm assuming, um, but it is to to understand. I might not be acting from a place of feeling and emotion but more times than not if not all the time that i'm leading with feeling internally that my experience very often is 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 uh with feeling i'm reacting with feeling um I, I'm, I'm feeling into the situation conversation or whatever it is and that those feelings they're not you know they run wide like the ocean and deep like the ocean and they're not just sort of um you know individual well they can be they could be like, like individual guitar notes but other times they can be like a symphony um and i think it might be hard for others to to feel into that right the embodied way maybe not entirely but um um but maybe have some appreciation for that uh, even though like i said i might not be acting from that place necessarily thank you jonathan how about you sandy i would say i want others to know that i am lovable 
and that mm -hmm. if they get to know me, they'll realize I have a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, Sandy. Yeah. Yeah. As a four, sometimes I myself feel that I, that um, there's something about fours being kind of afraid of being rejected, but also fours reject often. And I know that sometimes I often reject sort of things like invitations to go somewhere or to like come here or whatever, go there. And I sometimes I like, and then I, I don't go and I don't get involved, I think, because somehow I'm like, yeah, I don't know if it's really what I want to do because I'm sort of caught up in my authenticity and my need to be just true to myself and all that. And then often I'm kind of like lonely, and so I sort of wish that people don't give up on me and that they continue to invite me into their lives or into their gathering or into their um, Zoom call or whatever that might be. Um, but I think that I, I'm, I'm just curious if any of the other fours resonate with this sense of like, yeah, okay, Cheryl, yeah. Yeah, Jolene also maybe, yeah. So I, I kind of, I think my request would be, um, don't forget me. I you know sometimes I might be kind of rejecting you, but that's actually not what I really mean to do. I actually really want to join and I struggle to join to have a little more understanding around that. Yeah. You think that is just this need for belonging that you're wanting belonging? Yeah. 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 Oh, very good. So Lee, how do you think a uh, good time to open up maybe? Certainly. So are there any uh, questions from uh, people in the audience? Anything you'd like to know uh, from any of the fours? Any questions, any confusions? I know that um, Father uh, Ro Richard Rohr, has, he's a, a very powerful Enneagram teacher himself, who has said, um, I've heard him say that Enneagram fours are the hardest for him to understand. Um, and I've heard Russ Hudson say that Enneagram fours, in, he teaches all over the world, but when he te teaches in the US, he has found out that when people come into learning about the Enneagram, the four is the one that most Americans seem to want to be um, before they really understand what, what their type might be. And even though fours are actually perhaps the more rarest of the types as well. So Mary. Has Let me just address your on uh, Richard Rohr. I read his book and I don't think he presented the four very well at all. And in fact, I think that's probably his shadow as a one is that he doesn't see that. He sees them all as artists and stuff like that. And that's not true of me. And, and, and he's working with all these fours in the living school. It's like, um, so, yeah, I think he's come to appreciate the living school since he wrote that book and the fours. So he appreciates fours a lot more. Hey, so, Sammy, can I do this? Um, I will testify to um, the intensity and the real strong desire to dig in and get into stuff. Because um, the disclaimer, again, she's a, a best friend. And we work together through some really tough things and sometimes so tough that I have to say, okay, I can't hear about that anymore. I can't, I can't go there. I can't do it. Um, uh, but uh, there was a time where I, we were listening to a, to a talk and it, and it was, she was weeping and it was a really important, intense time. And, and uh, she, she was saying, I can't, I can't get my, I can't get joy. I can't get joy. And it wasn't me. Something came through me that said, Sandy, your joy is your melancholy. And it was so uh, striking. I mean, I felt like uh, the, um, the Course in Miracles would call this a holy instant where there was a joining where we just really saw and understood each other through and through on that. And that's why, even though it does seem like a very intimate thing to say, it was it was so uh, it, it blew something open for both of us. And, and it was such a gift, I think, for both of us. So the work with fours, oh, my God, as a three, you know, I was like, I don't know what my feelings are. I, 
I, I think I've moved past some of that, but I mean, the gift of, of having uh, a floor as a very good friend is, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, uh, really good. Uh, it's good work if you can get it. <laughs> so thank you, Sandy. Thanks, thank you. Thanks oh. Mary. That just touched me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary and Sandy. Anyone else have any questions? Some of you might have a stress point or an integration point to four. Anybody in the audience have any questions for our four panel members? Or anything you might you might want to just present as a comment? Well, thank you all so much. Um, I'm so drawn to you and and um and Several of you are my friends, and um, and I relate to you, you know, like so deeply. And um, and this isn't so much of a question as a comment that um, you know I've been living with for a while, which is you know the enneagram is really um, it, it eludes me in so many ways. I'm still pretty young and studying it. It's only been a couple of years, um, even though. Testing never showed me as a four. I just always felt like a four. And listening to you, it's like I, my heart just feels like it's like exploding with you. And um, I don't know if it's got, you know, like I love some of you very much, <laughs> you know, I love you all. Some of you are really like close to me, you know, and um, and so I, it's hard for me to kind of, you know, under to kind of figure it out, but still every time I hear fours talking or uh, there's, there's just so, I mean, sadly, I'm looking at you now and I'm going, I know that face. I've seen that face in the mirror. I just, I just know that I have. And um, it's just a very strange thing that I don't really know how to, I just felt like it needed, you know, I needed to kind of say it. Well, thanks Phyllis. And it, just to connect something to what you were just saying is that sometimes Type fours can be seen as being highly skilled at combining the personal and the universal. And one of the reasons, at least from my perspective, why they can be such successful artists is because of that ability to create something that's deeply personal, but which resonates with many people because they are able to access that personal level within themselves through the art of the type four who creates it. That does make me curious. So from our panel members, maybe just one sort of super quick question to the panel members. Um, fours do have a reputation for being some of the, some some of the, let me put it this way, some of the greatest artists of the world um, were likely type fours um, from Van Gogh to uh Prince, or it's just sort of there's a never ending list of uh, artists. Um, so I'm curious if each of you might share what what is your creative outlet? What it what makes you what get, what is your creativity? Um, and I'll just super quickly share mine. I think as far as creativity is concerned, I really fall into that Enneagram for kind of stereotypical idea of creativity in the sense that even as a child, I loved art, visual art, and I loved music. Even as a tiny three or four year old, I could sit on the piano and just play tunes that I heard, um, musically kind of gifted, creative. Um, I didn't nurture that, unfortunately, very much. But um, my first career was in fashion design. So just the whole world of design and color and texture was, was just hugely important to me. Um, 
And and even now, it's just any little corner that I can find or a little time. I'm just, I love making a little beautiful little something. If I'm inviting friends over, what, what I might prepare as food is often presented very beautifully. If I'm wrapping a gift for somebody, it's wrapped with like the perfect colored ribbon and the wrapping paper and I go into so much sort of detail around creating just a very sort of a mindful type of beauty. Um, uh, and also just very, I think I'm also just very creative when it comes to sort of um, teaching or just kind of working with some of the ways in which I work with my clients, for example. So, um, so yeah. So how about I go back to, um, oh, where's Cheryl? Oh, there's Cheryl. Cheryl, what's your creativity? As a four. Well, I've actually struggled with this. That was one reason why I thought maybe I wasn't a four is because I'm certainly not artistic. Um, you know, I um, certainly in the visual arts or anything like that. I don't really have any particular skills in that way. Um, like you, I, I, I played music. I played piano when I was a kid. And yes, I would, um, you know, work out the songs on my own and, um, so I like that the and I've I've done dance as well and I really in, enjoyed that but the only thing I can really come up with is I just seem to have a real sense of beauty in ideas and forms like I can pull together things that wouldn't normally look like they belong together and find some way of putting them together. So I'd said that's where the creativity makes a bit of sense to me. Yeah, the, I'm, I think I th I'm glad you pointed it out because I think it is a stereotype where some people think that fours have to be visually created, like that they're creating art. I, we did see your illustrations though, Cheryl, and they were pretty stunning. Your, your illustrations were pretty good. Some of us, uh, she shared uh, some sketches that she had done. Um, but so, um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not just the creativity of what we do. Sometimes it's just the creativity with which force see the world and make sense of the world. And it's even as, as sort of, uh, the aesthetics are everywhere. Creativity is everywhere and it's coming towards us. We're putting it out there. It's both. Yeah. So, uh, Jolene. Um, well, I got a mother load of, of um, talent, I guess. I, I, and in some ways, I'm kind of a dilettante. Um, I do oil painting, pastels, photography, gardening, cooking, Argentine tango. Um, I mean, creative parenting, uh, creative relationships. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I, I and and I want I want things to be you know like I used to sew and I'd make all these gorgeous clothes and in in some ways all of that is paralyzing because you know at this point right now I I I just got a really creative implant in my knee I have a, a new knee and so I've taken um, two months off of everything except I'm doing these really deep, uh, I joined a, a hardcore literature club. So I'm reading War and Peace and, and I'm, I'm like into Tolstoy and his writing and, you know, just, I, I can't stop, you know, this sort of appreciation of creativity and expression, but in some ways it, it's, it's very paralyzing to me as well. So. Thank you, Jolene. How about you, Imago? How does how does your creative energy show up? Um, well, uh, I have talked about the gardening and stuff. I mean, you know, across all of those things that you talked about, but I think mostly it is just, uh, and it's sort of like this aesthetic sense. And so it doesn't really matter what it is. I'll just have the sense of, oh, that that's got harmony or it isn't harmonious. And, it, and it's like a real felt sense in my body. And the worst part about it is if there is disharmony, it's really jarring, you know? Um, so I probably have, I do, I have to kind of 
manage my environment so that, you know, it doesn't irritate me, um, which is fine because I'm allowed to do that and I like doing it and, you know, um, I, 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 I have the ability. Yeah, so sometimes, like, the challenge for me is to be somewhere or be listening to something or whatever, be having an experience where there is disharmony and then find a way to be, for that disharmony to be okay because otherwise my aesthetic will drive me batty. <laughs> Thank you, Imago, yeah. I, I, I could resonate with that also. I think force tend to just like really feel into where something is disharmonious, especially sort of aesthetically, like in restaurants or, <laughs> yeah, events. <laughs> um, and then let's go to Jonathan. Yeah, early on, um... I, I drew a lot, um, and, and I, I drew furiously for, for a number of years, up until, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. And I kind of burnt myself out on it, uh, but it was a big part of, of my early artistic life. Um, later on, I, I think in terms of my career uh, as a teacher, I was very creative, and I don't mean just in terms of um, coming up with creative creative activities, but it was just sort of that in the moment interaction with students. I loved it. I loved it. I always said, you know, I don't need anything before the classroom starts or after the classroom starts. Give me those 45 minutes with the students. And I don't even have to have something on paper. You know, I'll, I'll come up with it. And I loved it. It just was energizing. Um, I, you know, this is going to sound a little bit corny, but um, I, to a great extent, I think sort of my life has become my art because of my drive to be authentic. I, I was trying to create something unique to me, for me. Um, and I really did consciously think of it like that a number of times. Um, more recently, oh, I should say not so, so recent, over the past maybe 20 odd years, um, maybe more, uh, I, I write poetry as a hobby. And... Um, I tell you, there's just something about that process for me at this point. Um, again, coming back to feelings, you know, a, a turn of words or a turn of a phrase gets right to like a feeling I'm trying to express. It just, you know, I'll have to think and feel into it and, you know, play with it. But it just like, because feelings sometimes they're just, in it, they can go so deep that they're inexpressible even to me. Like, uh, they're just like, I can't put it into words, but that's poetry then, right? how can I put it out there in poetry? Um, and so that really resonates with me now, uh, writing poetry. Beautiful, Jonathan. And finally, Sandy, how about you? How do you express your creativity? I don't have a creative bone in my body. I cannot do <laughs> anything. Um, but what I, I mean, I can't, when I wrap presents, they're just covered with something, lots of tape on them and I don't care. I, I really don't care about that. I'm, what I do is one of my teachers in the living school said, you speak truth like a prophet. And, and I think it's like, I see the world in a certain way and that's how I come across. And, and I've done big things in my life, put on big, you know, I've, I've run organizations. I've done things like that, which made, made me think I was a self-preservation for. So um, I, I, I read a lot. I mean, I'm in book groups and stuff like that, but, and I, I read, I've read so much in my life. So that's about, it just, I'm not real. That's okay. I mean, I'm not artistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes artistic and creative are two different things, you know, in, you know, I think, yeah, there are two different things, but yeah, I think that's just a really wonderful way in which I think Lee was uh, explaining to me uh, recently how I think I was asking Lee some questions about ones and, uh, and it's not that just because ones are seen as perfectionists, it's not, and they're very perfect in many ways, but not all ones are perfect in in the same way. Um, I think Lee's probably able to say this better, but I, I think I, I see that in the four world when it comes to creativity also. Just to reiterate that my point indeed is, is that Type ones tend to be perfectionistic in different areas based on their preferences and, and uh, 
the way they grew up and things like that. And I would say that the same thing is true for type fours is that their creativity shows up in different arenas. And Sandy, what you were saying is, is apparently your creativity also shows up in the way you communicate what you perceive in reality, but also I would say in your positions in leadership, because there have been many studies that um, show that people who are high up in organizations tend to be high in creativity, or at least uh, in the big five um, personality uh, type system, high in openness. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a, a very strong correlation between openness uh, uh, to experience and creativity. Yeah, that is true. Actually, it's, I took part in the Enneagram, uh, International Enneagram Association Conference last year, and one of the presentations presented a bunch of research that they had done on openness, uh, for example, and Enneagram Force came out um, at the top of openness. And they were really looking at sort of cultural ideas. So, for example, openness towards LGBTQ community, for example, Enneagram Force had came out at the very top, like the most amount of allowance for difference. The, for diversity and for difference in general. And um, so, yeah, that's very true. That's a gift of the four that actually fours can be very creative in just the sense of allowing people just to be whoever they are. Yeah. So thank you very much, everyone. We are, we have been closing our groups with, um, a poem from Rumi for each type, and we have a poem for type four. So here's uh, some words from Rumi that are, are good for all of us who are fours and for the four in all of us. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Mm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, especially to Cheryl, to Imago, Jolene, Jonathan, and Sandy for being our panel members. And for all of you who joined us as audience members as well, thank you. And we will see you next at the Enneagram 5 panel. <laughs>